Welcome, welcome everyone uh, to the Simon Dan podcast, the place where science and conspiracy collide. This is episode 16. I think I've got that right. I normally don't. I'm pretty sure it's episode 16. A um, couple of couple of apologies to make first. Um, we were supposed to be having Professor Dave on today uh, on this week, but unfortunately he couldn't make the recording that we, were, that we had set up. So uh, he's going to be on a later date, but we've still got a guest for you. Do not worry. Um Back today, he's had two weeks off. The man that's scared of ghosts, even though he doesn't believe in them, it's Cats. How you doing, buddy? You all right? I'm doing really well, mate. That, that jingle gets me every time. You I know? know, I think it says everything about me. I think hero, I know. athletic, yeah, well, you know, almost like a picture of Rambo in my head when I hear that jingle. It just it sums me up. <laughs> that's what we're going for. That's exactly what we're going for. I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased you like it. Anyway, how you doing, mate? You all right? Really good. Very busy, mate, but really, really good. And yes. I'm looking forward to today because, uh, I, you know, I really enjoy uh, astronomy. And I used to teach astronomy at GCSE to a very low standard. So I'm looking forward to speaking to someone who really knows this stuff. You did, yes, yes. And I, I, I want to do a bit of a refresh on, on some of my, um, on my degree learning stuff as well. So that should be good. Um Flat Earth, they are they're in real trouble, aren't they? Flat Earth, uh, another sleeping warrior lost his account, didn't he? Although I think he's restarted it. Uh, he he has always oh, well, he will undoubtedly restart. But that was a good day, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I did, uh, I did, I do confess to having a, a beer in celebration. Hey, night. um, I've got one coming out Friday, and it's uh, it's basically where are they now? It's a where are they now episode. So I go back to all the first Flat Earthers that I've uh, that I encountered when I first started the channel, and I look to see where they are now and out of about 15 i think it was 15 how many of them do you reckon their channel was gone out of out of 15 oh god it's been about three years i'm gonna say i'll say about six six or seven eleven eleven have gone. eleven channel out of the 16 so we're talking really a day so um i think it was 11 either either the channel's gone or they've stopped making flat earth content like d marble for example mm. he does a lot of political stuff now and um, but like Red Pill Philosophy, Sleeping Warrior, all of that. Um, I think I included Ranty in it as well because he gave his channel away, didn't he? Uh, but yeah, it's quite interesting. So uh, if, you, if you're a fan of the channel, keep an eye out for that on Friday. It's like a Where Are They Now episode. It was quite, quite an interesting look. Right, let's get on with the show. Uh, joining us this week is an astronomer who is the Director of Operations at an observ- Observatory in Hawaii. It's Tom Kerr. Welcome and thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Dan. Thanks very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Um, how's how's it going over there? You said you're getting a bit of uh, bad weather at the moment. Yeah, well, it's it's pretty miserable today. Um, we had indications of a very bad storm coming um, a few days ago, and it hit us last night with lots of thunderstorms. And as I told you in email, I was worried that you you wouldn't even be able to get hold of me today because. Yeah. Normally, when it's like this, some power just goes out. Really? Um, but uh, it wasn't quite... So far, it's not as bad as it, it was forecast, uh, but we're expecting a, several more days of this. So right now, it's it's cloudy and it's raining, um, but it's not too bad. So it's, it's almost like you're back in Britain. Yeah. Well, the town I live in, which is called Hilo, it's on the east side of the big island of Hawaii. It's actually the rainiest city in the US. Ah, Okay. That's, so, that's, um, do you know, I, 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 I pride myself on, on knowing things about geography. So like I can name all the countries in the world and uh, I, I know all the states of America and all of that. And the other day I saw a question on TV and it was about uh, a, a nickname for uh, an old explorer had for, the, for the, some islands in the US. And I was like, I couldn't think of it. I was like, oh, I haven't got a clue. Is it, is it Florida Keys? I haven't got... I, uh, Hawaii, obviously Hawaii, and I was I was shocked to myself that I didn't know it. <laughs> it, was really, it was really poor, really poor. Anyway, but my poor geography aside, what does the director of operations of an observatory get up to on a day to day basis? Okay. So my job is essentially to make sure that the oper- the, uh, the telescope and the operations that go behind that um, are going smoothly on a day to day basis. Okay. So I look after. I basically manage the engineering, uh, look after the how how we run things at night. So it's the kind of the, the and the manager of the operations. I think the best way to say it. We have the person above me is the actual director. Okay. Looks after the budget, 
but I take care of the uh, the kind of day to day running of the actual telescope. Okay, and how how often do you get like mechanical mechanical problems? Oh, they come in spurts. Yeah. So we can go for months without anything really serious happening, and then everything goes goes wrong at the same time. So just recently, um, just before Christmas, we had all sorts of problems. One, our main instrument. So our, we're an infrared telescope. Yeah. And our telescope, uh, sorry, our instruments have to be kept cold, cryogenically cold, you know, liquid wow. nitrogen temperatures. That stopped working. So the instrument warmed up. Then the dome stopped working. Then we couldn't move the telescope. And they all came at the same time. Yeah. So you can imagine, then we go into crisis mode. Um, and then, of course, you can have six months without anything happening at all. So it, it really varies. And is that is that um, in terms of a financial is that a financial problem if anyone's doing a certain sort of observation at the time it breaks down or no no not really because we basically have an operational budget okay. given to us every year all right um, so it costs the same whether we're we're broken or not yeah. I mean obviously we do our best to make sure it's working um, because we're not, we're not going to get the funding again if we just sit there broken sure yeah um, but. No, it's not. It's not really an issue. Okay, um, just to, just to to fill everyone in. So infrared uh, inf- infrared astronomy is, is obviously different to visual astronomy and radio astronomy and all of that. Do you want to just explain a bit about why that's different? Well, the the telescopes, an infrared telescope itself looks very much like an optical telescope. In yeah. fact, it, it, it's identical. Um, but the one thing you need to take into account with an infrared telescope is that the infrared is obviously heat. Yes. We're detecting heat. Um, and when we say heat, I'm not talking about sort of a thousand degrees or something like that. We're talking about things in space that could be, uh, you know, a few hundred degrees. Yeah. It's like brown dwarfs, for instance, that kind of thing. But the problem is an optical telescope, uh, they're designed, they, they actually give off their own heat. And so an infrared telescope is designed to give or to emit a small amount of heat as possible. So you can imagine some telescopes are a big tube, for instance, not many these days, but, but all that metal gives off radiation. And you detect that with an infrared um, instrument. So our telescope is designed to have as less, the, the smallest amount of mis- emission possible sure. that the actual mirror and the instruments can detect. So that's the main difference between an optical and an infrared telescope. And then obviously a radio telescope is, is a dish. Yes. So that's completely yeah. different. Yeah. So apart from that, essentially, um, there are little small design differences. So the secondary mirror, for instance, on an infrared telescope are tiny. Right. On an optical telescope, they're much larger, but that's because, we again, we don't want that secondary mirror to radiate heat, yes. which we would detect. So essentially that's the main difference. And then, of course, our instruments themselves have to be cold yeah. in order, one, for the arrays to work, or the sensors to work, and also, you know, if they're warm, they, you're not going to detect anything that's, sure. that's just, you know, a, a very faint object in space. It's just going to... So is, I, I assume it, that's because you're going to get a, a lot of noise in any images because yes. of the heat of the instrument. Yeah. yeah. So you're trying to minimise any thermal emission yeah from the dome and from the telescope so we have a very small dome for instance for the size of our telescope um the, if you're walking outside you've got it actually looks if the dome is closed it actually looks like a very small telescope and then when you walk inside you realize oh the telescope's big yeah it's just the dome was was made just so the telescope could fit in so the less metal you have essentially sure yeah. the better the, uh, an, uh, an infrared telescope will work. Yeah, and and in terms of the imaging, it, it, it often doesn't look too different, does it, once it's been processed? Once it's been processed, it'll look very different. Um, obviously, though, you're picking up different things. Yeah. Um, so, but, but yes, it, it's not like a radio image, which looks obviously looks very different. Well, yeah. um, optical and infrared images tend to look the same obviously you're seeing things that your eye doesn't see yeah but yes sure. they look they look very similar yeah yeah it's always always fascinates like one of the yeah. first things that i loved to learn about 
was the electromagnetic spectrum and, and how we only see a very small part of it. Um, oh, yeah, uh, tiny. Yeah, absolutely. Are you... So, I was going to mention there's another uh, technique that we have to do that you don't do in the optical, for instance. So okay. when you go into what we call the, the thermal infrared, yes. or the far infrared, um, so wavelengths of, say, 10 microns. Right. Um, at that point, the sky can be thousands of times brighter than the object you're looking at. Okay. And so the way what we have to use, we use a technique called chopping. And essentially what the, that does is that the top end, the, the secondary mirror, will actually vibrate with something like 10 hertz. Okay. And it'll, we call that chopping. So it goes, it, it looks in one spot and then it looks in another spot and then back to the same spot and, wow. and so on. Yeah. And then you subtract those two different images. Okay, and yeah. And that exactly. takes the sky out on your left yeah. with the object that you're looking at. Wow. Um, that, that reminds me a little bit about, uh, so when people talk to me about telescopes and they say, like uh, optical ones, like ones you can buy in the shop or whatever, and they say, oh, Dan, I saw this telescope and it's like a 600 times magnification. And I always say, well, hang on a sec. You can't, if you're zooming in that much, you're going to be zooming in in the atmosphere on Earth. Yes. You, need, you need about 300 times is about the most you can go with the visual telescope through our atmosphere. Yeah, you're, you're just going to see a lot of blurriness yeah. of the atmosphere moving things around. Yeah, so. I, don't know, I don't know how they get away with that, being allowed to write things like that, like five, 600 times. I, I guess it's technically true. It could do that, but it's, it was, it's, it's useless. It's technically true. It's just yeah. pointless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So have you been working on anything exciting uh, at the moment uh, at the observatory? So um, we haven't actually been doing any observations of this for the last few months. Okay. Um, in fact, this subject's not available at the moment. But one of the projects we've been involved in recently, which I find really interesting, um, is there's a, uh, an object which has seven Earth-like planets orbiting it. Wow. And I forget the name, so we're going to have to edit that one back in. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. <laughs> but it actually has the seven um, Earth-like, as I said, Earth-size uh, planets orbiting it, and um, we and three of those are in the so-called Goldilocks zone. Okay, I was going to say how many were. Yeah, so three three of them have potential uh, for water. Wow. And we can actually detect these planets going around this star basically by looking at the um, the brightness of them yeah. and as they pass in front of the star. Sure. The, yeah. the star. Yeah. But sometimes we can actually see the planets actually pass in front of other planets, eclipse the other planets. Oh wow! So you actually see the sun. Sorry, the the, the star dims and then it dims again a little bit, or the, the you'll see the their little dips in the. Um, in that dip in motion that, that because another planet is suddenly eclipsing things as well. Yeah. So that's, a, that's been a very interesting project. Do, do we know but, how uh, far, how far away they are? So I think it's about 40 light years away. Oh, okay. So that's pretty, pretty, pretty close. It's relatively close yeah. compared to the things we normally look yeah, at. Yeah, sure. Um, so I haven't said that. We also look at things that are orbiting the earth, uh, orbital debris. Oh, okay. In fact, we're doing a project at the moment. Uh, trying to understand what the orbital debris is, what it's made of, which is we can do that in the therm in the infrared because you can see in some cases they have a very they have a thermal property which changes as they go into the Earth's shadow. Right, they'll start cooling down, and you can tell what material they're made of. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and plus, obviously, we're also you can tell if that objects a threat to say some of our commercial satellites right. things like that okay. so we've been working on that project for the last few years as well. is there is there a lot of it orbital debris oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces out there wow all right some of them tiny you know you can imagine there's a you know the banana peel that an astronaut yeah left <laughs> up to rocket bodies wow so okay. you know that there, there are thousands of pieces out there oh, and oh, they're okay. becoming it's becoming worse, yeah, obviously. Sure, yeah. And obviously they're all, <laughs> all too I'm small. Sure to the Kessler syndrome. The, the what, sorry? The Kessler, the Kessler syndrome. Oh, okay. Which is what happens if some of these things collide. And you end up with a uh, thousand more pieces. Yeah. A thousand chances to hit another satellite. Yeah. More than a thousand of pieces and you basically get a runaway effect. Sure. I was going to say, I guess all those objects are too small to pick up optically. The smallest pieces, 
Yes, but we can detect things that are are pretty small. Okay. You know, a, a few centimeters across, that oh. kind of thing. Um, our telescope's not was never designed to do this work, but we found ourselves doing it. Oh. But in the infrared, of course, they 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 are bright, even though they're small. They're bright because they're warm. Sure. Okay. So they're quite easy to detect. Wow. So I um I used to teach astronomy in uh, in high school or secondary school over here. But the problem with doing that over here is obviously that happens during the daytime. So it's very difficult to get out there and do the, you know, the practical sort of astronomy. Um, so we, we ended up focusing on a lot of theory. And one of the questions I used to get asked a lot of parents evening by parents was, how can we affordably, you know, the kids are really interested, you know, they've got this real enthusiasm for astronomy now and they, they want to get into it. How do we affordably and practically uh, get into it? And I, I really didn't have the answer, um, in, in all honesty. How, what would your advice be to someone who's really enthusiastic at a young age who wants to get into it? Well, I'm sure, I, I don't know what it's like in the UK these days, but I know well, there used to be lots of astronomy clubs. And I think that's probably the best way to do it, where you uh, join up with a lot of other amateur astronomers and that they have their own telescopes. I mean, you may not be able to afford to have a telescope, but these people are generally very happy to let you, you know, share their, the use of the telescope with them. And I can I can see with kids, it's probably that you, you're not going to do classes at night because they're not going to be keen. They want to go off and play football mm. and whatever, or gaming or something like that. But I think for those who are really keen, that's probably the best way. If they can find a club in their local area, to join that. And you'll have some very knowledgeable people there, not necessarily um, professionals, although they may well be. And I think that's probably the best advice. Yeah, I think that's, that's great advice, actually, because, uh, I mean, a lot of the kids that we had, they were asking, well, what telescope should I buy? What should I use? And I really had no idea, you know, and I felt really bad not being able to put, you're right, you send them to a club where someone's got the telescope, they can learn by doing, yeah. can't they, and pick it up as you go along. Exactly. Advice, yeah. And I, would, I wouldn't advise anyone to just go off and buy a telescope off the shelf. Yeah. And they're going to be disappointed. Sure. Hmm. So yeah. if you can find someone who's already got one and knows what they're doing or go to a club you'll soon learn what works and what doesn't yeah and uh, i think that's the best way but definitely don't just go off and buy a telescope and think you're going to see you're going to see the rings of uh saturn or something like that you might do you might be lucky but yeah you're that's probably going to be quite disappointed and the worst thing about that it will actually it could probably put you off astronomy yeah, yeah. it's good advice because so i would what, one yeah, of the, one i would of... definitely go to a club or join up with a club if you can hopefully there, there, there's a club near wherever you know your kids there are i know there are several clubs around the country yeah so that would be my advice yeah i think i think there are there are a few it's just i I don't see them advertised they're not very well advertised you say that's fair cats like things like that over here yeah i guess i never i never see them uh never see billboards or you know never see anything out in papers but i suppose if you uh if you if you googled it, you'd find yeah, Facebook yeah. groups yeah, and yeah, local, wouldn't you, or Twitter or something? Yeah, it's great advice. Um, it's funny because uh, that I kind of self taught myself. Uh, self taught myself. I was self taught with astronomy. Uh, I kind of bought my first telescope, and uh, you're right. It's a little bit underwhelming when you first view uh, your first objects when you see on the TV and and on and and the things that images that NASA produces. But it still didn't take the shine off for me, and and the more I the more I did it, the more I was I was fascinated. Um, and personally, when I heard all the stories about Newton and Kepler and things like that and the history of astronomy, that's what first inspired me to do it. What sort of inspirations did you draw from when you were first interested in astronomy? It, it was more science than astronomy. Okay. Um, so my father was a big influence on me. Sadly, he passed away a long time ago now but he was a meteorologist ah, okay and he would tell me he would talk to me about science and meteorology and i found it fascinating um but then in the evening when he wasn't working he worked shift works but it, i think i can't remember now this is the early 70s <laughs> we would sit down together and watch star trek yes the original series yes nice and even though these days I am not a science fiction fan, I, I will tell you that, that 
made me very interested in astronomy. And I think my father bought me an astronomy book at one point. And I just love looking at these pictures of nebula, for, its, for instance, all yes. those colors, yeah, seeing all those stars. And I was thinking, what would it be like to visit there? Is, is there life there? And some of that just got me going into astronomy. But I didn't pursue astronomy as a career when I was, say, was a teenager. I never thought I would, that would happen to me. It was kind of accidental in the end. Um, I went to um, what was then the, the university, well, it's now the University of Central Lancashire. And my intention was to become a teacher at UCAS. Um, but one of the courses I was doing was astronomy. I was doing physics and astronomy, essentially, um, mainly because I liked the astronomy, but I thought the physics would be very useful um, in a career, even if I didn't go into teaching. <laughs> and then I got into a research um Oh, in my final year, I should say, I did a research project in astronomy. And the guy who was, who was supervising me, a guy called Dr. Derek Ward-Thompson, still works in the UK now, wonderful guy. He was such a good supervisor. He, he, I just fell in love with research and what I was figuring out. I was actually given data that no one had looked at before to, to look at and come oh, up with nice. a... Uh, you know, just come up, figure out what was going on. This was a young object in a molecular cloud, basically a star that had just formed. And so I decided, oh, I want to do this as a career. This is just a wonderful thing. I'm just finding out so many things about. It's something that people or someone, no one else in the world has seen. Yeah. And that's really what got me into it in the end. So it was my father's influence in science. And then when I was at university. Oh, wow. That's, that's very... That sounds very similar to 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 Kepler because he was given a load of data about about Mars mm. and uh, he had to figure right. that out. Um, yeah, it was doing that unique thing that no one had done before. Yeah, well, they'd done it, but on different objects. Yeah, sure. But yeah, it's something you see, you're looking at something that no one knows anything about. They've never looked at before, and you're suddenly finding out how massive this thing is and what's going on. It, this turn, this case, it was a star that had a big disc around it. And you could work. You could figure out the, the mass of the disc. Yeah. And you could work out the energetics of what was going on because, that, as well as the disc, it had an outflow of gas. From, and you, you could just figure out all the physics. Awesome. And that I, it just blew my mind. You yeah. know, that you could figure this out just from pointing a telescope. It is. It is mind blowing. Absolutely. Data, yeah. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, right, we're going to get into a bit of uh, conspiracy stuff in a bit, but it, we're, we've got a new part of the show here, which I'm calling Cat's Curiosity. So this is the part where Cat's is going to bring us a piece of science news that has interested him over the last week, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to have a chat about it. So what have you got for us, buddy? Well, I've got, uh, I've got well, a stunning coincidence, actually, because uh, you mentioned UCLan University, and I was actually in Preston today, uh, not far <laughs> from it Amazing. at all. So, uh, sorry, I, I just love, had to get that out. <laughs> <laughs> I love Preston. I absolutely love Preston. Wonderful <laughs> place. Spent seven years there. So that's it, just, it, that's just, nice. just north of London, yeah? Uh, is that why? <laughs> it's north of London for sure. Yeah, it's definitely north of London. Uh, not not far from me. Okay. Uh, so what have I got today? I've actually I've tried to be brave, right. and I've tried to bring a scientific topic that links. But I'm, I'm uh, with with uh, <laughs> with the guests that we've got on the show. But I'm hoping that I've got my facts and stats right because uh, I'm sure I'll be corrected if I haven't. Um, now. What's fascinating me in the world of science lately is that eight days ago, we saw a meteorite over the UK, and uh, it was estimated to have landed just north of Cheltenham. Now, why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting to me because of the statistics that surround it. So, for example, did you know that every single day, and uh, I'm sure you both do, there are millions of tiny pieces of debris and uh, meteoroids that travel through the Earth's atmosphere? Sure. But out of these, I found this fascinating, right? Out of those millions, how many, Dan, do you think hit the ground every year? Oh, this is either going to be really low or really high, because either way it's going to shot. I'm going to say five. Oh, well, you've, uh, you've blown me out the weather. Um, <laughs> 500, which I thought was really low compared oh. to millions. Over a year, oh, yeah, no, 500 is millions low, yeah. a day. I went way too low. 
But but the five five is not because it turns out that of the five hundred hit the ground every year, only five or six are actually recovered. Ah uh, yes, that's what, I mean. that's what I was going for. <laughs> well done. And that might have something to do with the fact that you know as they come through the air and they're glowing and they're on fire. Once that light has gone out, they've still possibly got up to another twenty kilometers to travel right. after that light has gone out. Now I hope I'm getting this all right. Um, I, I did research what the uh, chances of being hit by a meteorite, and it does turn out that in uh, in the 1980s, Nature did a study on this, and they said that the last person to have actually been hit by a meteorite was someone called Anne Hodges, uh, and apparently, the uh, it's we, we are scheduled for one person being hit by a meteorite every 180 years. So we're looking for 21. 34 before the next person gets hit. I hope I've got my stats right. How did that sound? Have I made any mistakes there? I, I didn't know that, uh, but it sounds reasonable to me. But you've also just made me think. I think I read a story just a few months ago about someone getting hit. I forget where it was. Oh. Well, they got partially hit. Oh, Their car got hit or something like that. Okay. Ah, right. I'd have to look that up. I can't remember it now, but I think someone recently... Certainly had a close encounter. Yeah, with a meteorite. I've, so. got, I've got a question. Um, did, did it say roughly what size the meteorite has to be for it to survive to hit the ground? It did, and I didn't write that down, so oh, I'll refer that to uh, it, Tom. I think. <laughs> I, I think that can also depend on on how it enters the atmosphere, yes. the angle, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think you can give a straightforward answer okay. to that. Okay, that's fair enough. That's fair. Like that reminds me a bit of the the the, the, the flat earthers and space deniers who say about there's only ever circular craters on the moon, don't they? They always come up with that mm. one, uh, yeah. even though you can clearly find ones that aren't. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I remember doing about three chapters on that about the angle of of meteorites and stuff like that, and and the angle of impact, and they were three of the most boring chapters I've ever read. <laughs> honestly. Honestly. I think aren't there some remnants of craters? I think it's in Chile or maybe Argentina, where yeah. you can actually see that this large uh, meteorite came in, meteor, uh, and and basically struck at an angle and caused several craters. Kind of in oh, okay, yeah, yeah. On the way in, I think I'll, so, I think uh, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's a fast, fascinating topic that one. But thanks for that, Kat. So that was uh, that was very interesting. We're gonna have to. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and find that out about the, the size limitation thing. Um, I enjoyed that. So, uh, Tom, the flat earthers and the anti spacers. Uh, do you think that he's face palming? Look, do you think a tour of your observatory with some detailed viewing would go a long way to convince flat earthers and space deniers that they're wrong? I doubt it. <laughs> would they cry CGI? Uh, well, I don't think they could do CGI. Okay. Uh, well, they might do because you can't you can't really look through our telescope with your eye. No, you of know, course, yeah, 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 yeah. So they could even just say it's CGI. It's made but, up on the screen, yeah. Um, I I don't think it would convince convince them at all because all they'll just say, oh, "Well, you're just pointing at this star, whatever they think a star is." Um, I think I just saw something recently on on your um, channel, Dan about this guy saying stars are very close and the sun isn't hot. And, oh, yes, uh, yeah. Good old yeah, multi tom tom Yeah, yeah. So someone like that, they're just going to say, well, you're looking at this star that's in our atmosphere or something like that. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't see it. I just don't see how it would convince them. I do wonder. I mean... I do wonder ahead. how many of them have actually looked through an optical telescope and seen a planet. Because I, 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 I just can't believe that if they've looked for a telescope and seen a planet... That they don't think that that's real. That, that I can't believe that they would deny that. Well, even even if they think it, it's real, would they actually say, "Well, that that you know that doesn't prove that the Earth is round"? Sure. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, they could look at Saturn, or they could look at um, Jupiter and actually see its moons. That's yeah. easy to do in a telescope. It is. Yeah. And how would that convince them that the the Earth is round? I, you know, I know why it would convince me, and it would convince you and others, and others. But I, I don't see if they, if they got to this point and they still think the Earth is flat, then I don't think anything like that would convince them. No, no, you're right. I just, I just think that um, the, the, the anti-space flat earthers that 
for me, that seems to be the first thing that you want to try and crack. The space is real before you crack the flat earth issue. Oh, in, in that case, I think the, the people who don't believe there's space, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking more than general, just your general flat earth. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot I of think the anti like spaces, yes. I think maybe that would help that you could actually move from object to object. And yeah. say, look, I do wonder. And you can actually see, for instance, you can actually see the moons of um, Jupiter move over time. Yes, you, you can see, it, and the shadows. Hour, you'll see it move. The shadows as well. Um, can't you? Yeah, and I can I can take not with the setup we have at the telescope right now, but I did this a few years ago. We actually looked at Pluto as a test observation. Uh, we'd gone to this mode of observing we hadn't done for years, and I looked at Pluto just to check our image quality. And you can actually see its moon Sharon move around. Oh, it. wicked! Awesome, and that's, in, pr- that's pretty. In, and it was just a few minutes. You could actually yeah. see the, the, the thing move. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah, those anti spaces maybe we could convince them, but I think the others probably, probably sure, not. Sure, sure. Um, cats. How many do you think there are that are anti spaces that aren't flat earthers? So, oh, a globe with a dome then, yeah. like a. I don't think I've I've come across one of those. No, no. 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 What What about the other way around? So they think that. The Earth is a globe, but they, but they don't think that is space. Now that's the same thing, isn't it? I've I've heard some people say, uh, okay, the Earth isn't a globe, but space does exist, but it's not what we think it is. Yeah. Obviously, they won't provide a yeah, different yeah, explanation. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Look, for, uh, from what I experienced, it, you, one usually comes with the other, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 For, for their flat Earth to exist, space kind of has to be an issue as well. Hmm. Um. Tom, you've also done, when we first chatted, you've also done quite a bit of research into astrology, haven't you? Do you want to tell us a bit about that? I wouldn't say a lot of research, just an interest in why people believe in astrology. And it's a, it's a, I think it's just people think, a lot of people, and I'm not saying everyone, but a lot of people just want to think that life is not under their control. It must be under someone, someone else's control. Yeah, and it's all this fate, and there must be a way of being able to tell what it is, what what's going to happen to me, and something like that. And of course, this is how people thought centuries ago. Yeah, and yeah. Because the stars and planets moved. Well, the, the the planets moved in different ways to the stars. They thought they were gods, and they thought depending where the gods were, that that controlled their lives. Um, and they co- and, th- and astronomical events coincided with. Uh, the spring, you know, the, I think the, the Nile, you know, you would start getting things, vegetation growing around the Nile, always at the same time, and it happened when every, when there was always this same astronomical event, you know, this constellation came around, that they thought there was a connection between what happens to, on Earth, what happens to us, and what happens up in the sky. And, of course, I was wondering, what, what, why do people still believe in this? And I don't really have an answer to that, but... So I wouldn't say it's a, a deep research, but but I also wanted to try and show to people why it's not true, um, that there is no link and there is no force or anything like that that's actually controlling our, our lives. Yeah. So how did they get around the uh, the extra constellation being found, which surely throws everything out of whack that the uh, astrologers... They conveniently ignored it. All right, I mean that's the that's, that's the way you do it. So, so a couple of things I did as uh, you know, basically as a, a skeptic of astrology, is I learned a little bit of astrology. I actually talked to professional astrologers and got their recommendations for the best books to learn. Okay, and then I started doing my own readings with very little knowledge. Within a, basically a month of reading this book, and I would basically do cold reads. Sure. I would just figure out what someone was interested in, what they what they were like as a person, depending on what they'd said on you know online or anything like that. Yeah. And then I just tailored my my astrological reading to what they were like. And in the end, the professional astrologers would say that this is this is perfect. This is great. You're very good at this. And then I told them that I I didn't use astrology at all on yeah. my knowledge of astrology. I just tailored my reading, and and found cherry picked things out of what astrology you know this what was in the astrology book yeah so they couldn't say well that doesn't make sense because i would say well it does it's in the book yeah someone's saturn cross mercury or something like that 
is very good at art or something like that. <laughs> so I'd pick on that, but then modify it just for that person. Brilliant. Uh, and that was the way. The other the thing I did, and this actually got me into a bit of trouble. <laughs> I ended up getting sued. Oh, no. Um, I, I, the case got thrown out. Okay. But there was an astrologer who, he's passed away now, but I, I won't mention the name out of, out of respect. Sure. Who claimed that they could make money out of the gold market by predicting whether the gold will go down or up right. on a daily basis. Okay. And he would publish these uh, the predictions every week. And so I looked at his predictions and compared them to the actual prices and found out at first, which astonished me, that there was a statistical um, significance to his predictions. Right. His predictions were more, weren't just random, which surprised me. The one surprise, though, they, his predictions were more wrong right. than they were right, okay. than you would expect. Then I looked at, well, even all right, even though he gets it wrong more than he gets it right, why is this statistically uh, significant? Found out he made predictions for the weekend as well. And, of course, the markets aren't open. So he was always right. wrong on okay. Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. And that's what put it... Uh, that's what made it statistically significant. When you took those predictions out, it right, was completely random. I see. Yeah. Then he sued me because I called him a fraud. Oh, <laughs> that's that's not good, is it? I mean, uh, he also sued two thousand other people. By what? The way. And uh, yeah. he, what? T- don't tell me he's successful with any of them. No. No. Okay, that's good. No, it was one lawsuit against two thousand people. Oh, okay. Um. I, that, do you know what that reminds me a bit of? I, I don't know if you remember this, cats. I think I can't remember what it was. It was a World Cup one time. There was an octopus that they were getting to predict the results, weren't they? I remember. And he or or she, whatever the, the sex was of the octopus, it picked an unbelievable amount right, didn't it? It did. It was. They even nicknamed it, didn't they? I yeah, can't remember what its I name was, but it was famous. Was it twenty ten or or twenty fourteen? I can't remember. It was. It was around that time, wasn't it? I think. I think it did a couple. I, I think different. it was South Korea. I know that. I'm sure it was South Korea one, but yeah, it just and that and obviously that was random, uh, but it was getting it right every single match. Um, so randomness can can be correct sometimes, all the time. Yes. Yeah. Um, I I once made a video on astrology. I don't know if you've seen it. It's on the channel. Um, and I called it destroying astrology in less than ten minutes, and. I got a lot of hate for that video. Yeah, I triggered sure a lot of people. And I, so basically, I the whole the whole thing on the video was I used um, I, I used the fact that the Earth wobbles to dictate that the, that the constellations aren't the same as they were 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So the sun is in a different constellation than the day you were born, so you're on the wrong star sign. That was basically how I... I how yes, I, I and you're right. Yes, you're yeah. right. But all the astrologers said... No, no, no. This is 1% of what actually astrology is. You've got it all wrong. Read some real astro- astrology. You know, you're not... Am I... Did I get it all wrong? Is there more to astrology than that? It's... Yes, you're right. So I did it in my um, my reading and, and just talking to astrologers. Some of them are good friends of mine. Okay. You know, despite being a you know, skeptic. Yeah. You know, we became good friends over, over time. Um. This business of um, the sun sign being wrong um, is not really what a, a professional astrologer would do. So what sure. you see in the paper yeah. is complete and utter rubbish. Yeah. But what a, a professional astrologer does is actually just look at your actual time. Uh, they don't care whether you're a Virgo okay. or, uh, or whatever, and they and they – they construct your chart and then deal and then make the predictions based on that. It doesn't matter. However, they will still call you a Virgo, for instance, yeah. even though you're not, the sun was in Virgo. Yeah. It's still nonsense. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. But when you do, when you go to professional astrologer, and this is actually what I did when I made these readings, I did, I used the same software as they did to, to, to make the chart yeah. and then figure out all the little things they were doing. And, but then it was the cold, in the end, it was the cold read that people believed in and not, not really what was happening in astrology. It had nothing to do with it at all. Yeah. 
Okay. So yes, you would have got a lot of feedback about that because yeah. I think the professional astrologers that's actually happy. how they do it. They forget the sun you yeah. forget about the sun sign, it's it's the actual okay. time and date okay. of your birth and where it is. I'm gonna have but to, it's still more Yeah. It's more articulated nonsense, isn't it? I'm, I'm gonna have to. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna have to redo that maybe then, and, and say <laughs> I'll have to hold my hands up and say I was naive. Um, I, I, a lot of well, people, most people are annoyed because I, I told them they were reading the wrong star sign their whole life. That was the well, main that's thing. Still, that's still true, though. Yeah. I mean, if they're looking at newspaper, it is um, horoscopes. That's exactly you're exactly right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They weren't happy with that either. But. Um, <laughs> it, the cold reading thing is interesting because because cats and I did a podcast with uh, with Wolf who who kind of mm. cold read cats um, and it, it's similar in a way isn't it that um, like we obviously don't believe that it's real we don't believe there's anything into it but there are still those that charge money for it online uh, just like the the psychic mediums yeah um uh, I, that's that's disgusting and this disgraceful i think it's a fraud and that's why i got into trouble about astrology because yeah. just for this reason, yeah I call and it a fraud. have you have you was. have you stayed out of the uh the argument since then um have you dabbled on that particular yeah I, I mean that kind of scared me off a little bit yeah i didn't want to go through that again because it costs money sure yeah yeah, yeah. get a lawyer yeah. um but i still argue um yeah. And I also often, I often still use a bit of, um, so I used, to, I used to have a blog. It's still up there, actually. I could point out to you, point it out to you after the, the show. Yeah. And I actually do, on you know, on April the 1st, I used to make posts, ridiculous posts about astrology. Nice. About how all the astronomers on Mount Acaia sit at different tables at dinner based on their star signs <laughs> and things like that. So, Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. And did anyone believe it? Someone must have believed it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Amazing. There was one oh. person even on the. You know, I basically told them a night what we did at night, and it was basically producing the horoscope for the newspapers the next morning. Um, and yeah, there was someone actually in the comments said, "I didn't know that." That was what that was really interesting. So, well, I'll tell you what: if if it all goes wrong at the observatory, you've got a backup career there, haven't you? Yeah. So, yes. uh, you're good. You're all good. <laughs> right, it's time to play Guess the Conspiracy. Right, I'm confused at the score. I'm genuine. So this is this is game 15, and I think I think it's 9-6 to us. No, it's 9-5 to us. Yeah. I've got it. It's 9-5 yeah. to us. <laughs> so, so this is the point where Katz and I have come up with a fake conspiracy each. Uh, and we're going to give you two and also going to give you a real one. And it's your job, Tom, to tell us which one you think is the real conspiracy theory in that people believe that it's a thing. Um, so, yeah, it's 9-5. Nine, it's nine five, So the pressure's on. Uh, you could claw one back here or we could be further ahead. So yeah. here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, Finland is not a real country. That's conspiracy number one. Uh, number two, there are chemicals placed in our food which inhibit plant life in the seas and lakes our waste ends up in, which keeps the amount of life low and the cost of food high. Uh, and number three, gold is not a real element. It's usually tin or zinc that has been made to look like gold. There we go. Let me know if you want me to repeat one. So all of these are, I mean, they're obviously rubbish. They're all rubbish, obviously. I've got to find, out, I've got to find out which one is actually out there. That people believe in, yes. Yeah. I, I don't think the gold one okay. can be it. I think that's too easy to disprove. So we're left with Finland as the country. Mm-hmm. And there are molecules put into food or, or whatever substance put into food. Yep. Molecules put into that food. Sounds, that sounds viable. Okay. But also the Finland one, for some reason, is crazy enough <laughs> <laughs> that I can imagine it, though you can look it up on a map. Mm. Therefore, I'm going to go with the silly one that is Finland. You're going with the Finland one? Yeah. 
Okay, here we go. Yeah, well done. Well done. Do you know what? I was a bit worried that uh, it it sounds like one that where I couldn't think of one, so I just thought, let's make up a country that's not real and just put that up there. But it is the real conspiracy theory that people believe in. Yeah. It is so and well it, done. It's crazy enough. I think the gold one's crazy, but, but it, it's so easy to disprove. You, because yeah. people have gold, they see yeah. gold. Yeah, that, that was my one, the gold one. So, yeah, well, well done. Yeah. Uh, cats came up with the not, no, not everyone has gone to Finland. No, they haven't. Well, they haven't. So the, I actually pulled this one from... Uh, from um, thingy's uh conspiracy chart you know when we had oh yeah 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 but so the conspiracy chart yeah. that i pulled it from that it was one of the ones from the top um and i i, I was like you yeah, i can't believe that the people don't believe that. Right. i mean i've heard the australia one obviously but finland is not a real country so there you go well done so it's nine six now nine six well, uh, why, why do people believe finland isn't a country I don't know. We, it, we asked her, didn't we? We we asked Rebecca, and and uh, I I couldn't. I can't remember what she said. What did she say? Oh, I, can't, I can't remember what it, what it was. But uh, I mean, let's face it. Is it is it any less silly than believing you know the Earth is flat or no. you know there's a dome <laughs> that we can't see that meteorites can pass through, um, you know, without breaking? It's uh, they're all blown into one for me these yeah. days. Yeah. Oh, not, but, oh, not what am I saying, Rebecca? For Abby, of course it was Abby Richards. Um, so yeah, there we go. It's nine six. Well done. We are the people are people are figuring us out, cats. They're figuring us out again. We need to up our game. Um, so we, we are gonna we're gonna at some point we're gonna have a chat about. Uh, I've got a new game that I've got that, that I'm developing, uh, which to match the the quality of Guess the Conspiracy. Uh, so we'll talk about that at some point. So so uh, keep an eye out for that. But for now. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting about all things astronomy and, and and all that and astrology. And um, we can find you. Where can we find you? In terms of in, in, uh, like so, yeah, social media stuff. Have you got anything on social media or? No, I I'm, I read, I don't do Twitter. Okay. Um, I don't do Facebook. Um, I well, was on Facebook once and just got fed up with it completely. I know what you mean. Uh, I stopped for six months all, once. All yeah. these old friends suddenly turn up. Well, not friends. I mean, people I knew, and then yeah. you know, it, it just got too much. Well, what we'll do is we'll we'll post links to the to your observatory uh, so people can check out all the work that you do there. And stuff yeah, like that, so. and I do have a I say I do, do have a blog. It's still available. I haven't posted there for years. Perfect. We'll pop that up as um, well. There are a lot of pictures. So you, uh, one of my hobbies is photography. Nice. A lot of pictures from the mountain um, from Mount Akea. Excellent. And so on. So, Amazing. so I'll send that on. Okay, we'll do that as well. We'll pop that in there as well. Um, so that's it. We're done, everyone. Uh, next week is a bit of a different one. Uh, cats on O's Cats looking forward to this one. We're going to be talking about the science of Red Dwarf. Uh, Red Dwarf is, a, is an old uh, uh, television program here in the UK, uh, like a comedy sort of thing in space. And we're going to talk about the potential of how real or how possible the science is involved. So it should be a good one, that, shouldn't it? I'm looking forward to it. I love that programme. Yeah, Absolutely yeah, love it. Really good. So, it was a uh, wonderful show. Yes, I loved it. it is. It, it is. was so great. It should, it should be good fun. Uh, but for now, we are done. Uh, everyone stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.